Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Can you guys hear me? Um, I suppose you can. First of all, I'd like to apologize for my delay. I had an emergency coming in. That is the reason why I had this delay, but inshallah, next time it will not happen. So I'm uh, just getting my tablet ready. Oh. So can I just ask quickly, which one, uh, who among you has ever studied fit before? Or if this is your first time, if all of you are reverts, we'd just like to know a little bit about uh, all of you so that I can understand. Which level should I be teaching Islam? Okay, let's see. Um, Rachel, first time. The admin revert server, first time. Georgia, first time. Alhamdulillah. That's uh, it's good. So we have uh, a lot of first timers. Inshallah, I will try to begin from the very basics so that we're all on the same page. Just need to open one software. Raisa, I think we got open soon. There's a cloud. Smooth cloud. Open. Uh, zoom. Zoom. Meetings. Can I show my, can the admin please allow me to share my screen, please? Thank you. Yeah, sure. Yes, just waiting, share screen. Uh, okay, I can share my screen now. Now, you should all be able to see a blank screen that I have right now. So, we're going to begin our lesson now. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salam, ala ashraf al-anbiya wal mursaleen, nabiyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in, wa ba'd. Dear brothers, dear sisters, listeners, welcome to our first lesson of Fiqh in the Discord channel for Muslim Reverts. So, um, we are studying the topic called Fiqh. Now, what does Fiqh mean. Fiqh literally means to understand. This means understand. So fiqh is the study of, uh, we can say, this is uh, how we understand the laws that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed to us in the Quran and through the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is known as now, how do we get to understand? Okay, as we mentioned, fiqh. Fiqh comes from understanding. Uh, before we go forward, let me tell you, 
The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in a hadith, Man yuridillahu bihi khayran, whoever Allah desires good for him, yufaqihuhu fi deen, o faqihuhu fi deen. Allah makes this person understand the religion. Makes him understand the religion. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala desires good for a servant, he makes him understand. This alone should let us know and understand that fiqh, understanding uh, Islam, this is one of the greatest things ever that a Muslim can do. And this is what we should strive, okay? Now, uh, fiqh linguistically means understanding. Now, religiously, when we speak in Islam and we say we're studying fiqh, we basically we basically mean this, ma'rifatu ahkamu sharia, which is basically knowing, okay, or learning. Let's just say learning, learning about ma'rifatu ahkamu sharia, about the Islamic rulings, okay. التي طريقها الاجتهاد which are derived from اجتهاد uh, if in any way I, uh, I mention certain words terminologies that you're not understanding feel free to comment okay we're going to explain this sentence Okay. Fiqh is learning about the Islamic rulings which are derived from ishtihad. So, first thing we can see here is learning, ma'rifah. So, fiqh, dear brothers and sisters, is something that must be studied. Okay? You're not, you're not going to be born with it. Okay? You need, to, you need to read this. You need to study. Someone has to teach you is the first thing we've all gone through this process and everyone will go through this process until the day of judgment inshallah now where do we study okay this is now where we come to we go to the uh, the sources sources of knowledge now what i'm teaching you right now is not necessarily fit but an introduction to fit okay sources of knowledge this means where do we study where do we know which rulings should we take and which rulings should we not take okay because i mentioned it's it's learning it's studying but what exactly what is the object of study now the sources of knowledge for fiqh so fiqh is derived, this learning about the Islamic rulings. We derive this information from the Quran, okay, which is the, the, the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is the second thing, the sunnah, okay. Some people will add sunnah mutahara, it's fine, you know, which basically means the authentic sunnah. Okay, because the narrations should be authentic in fit, because if they're not authentic, then uh, they're not really that helpful. So the first source of knowledge is the Quran. The second is Sunnah. Actually, the Quran and Sunnah are in the same category. When it comes to being a source of knowledge, the Quran and Sunnah hold the same weight because everything that was revealed in the Quran and the Sunnah, they both come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah revealed what's in the Quran and Allah revealed what's in the Sunnah. So both are fine. Now, the second, Quran, Sunnah. Then we come for Ijma. Okay? Ijma. Ijma means consensus. So Ijma means consensus of scholars, Muslim scholars, to the year 300. So up to the year 300 Hijri, if all scholars across the Muslim land agree in a certain issue, 
then we consider this as ijma as being something that has been agreed upon and it is the truth the haq. okay and uh, this this is because it's not like scholars our scholars gathered around in a meeting and they they uh, got to one conclusion no we're saying that different scholars in different parts of the muslim land derived at the same conclusion in different times now this is is a, a very good evidence and anything that's that's ijma will always be in the quran and in the sunnah okay and last and least normally we say last but not least this time it's last and it's actually least is what we call qiyas qiyas is known as an analogy okay what does this mean qiyas is what Muslim scholars use when there's nothing in the Quran, nothing in the Quran, nothing in the Sunnah, nothing in Ijma. So the only thing you can do is Qiyas. Okay? So Qiyas is basically you take an existing ruling that's in the Quran and the Sunnah and you export that ruling to another situation which is similar or the same but wasn't directly mentioned in the Quran and Sunnah. Example, the Quran and Sunnah does not speak about smoking. Nothing's there saying smoking is the same. But what we do have is that anything that harms your health is a sin. Like eating, uh, drinking blood is a sin. Uh, eating a pig is a sin. Um, what else do you have? Eating dead meat is a sin. Why? Because they're not healthy. It's unhealthy. It damages your health. So we take the ruling that, that these things are haram because they damage your health. Okay? So therefore, cigarettes also damage your health. Okay? So if we have here a piece of dead meat, you know, Dead meat, dead meat. Now, it equals haram. Why? Because it's unhealthy. Now, likewise, you can also say that smoking, you know, is also unhealthy. Therefore, it is haram as well. Why? Because it has the same rule. This is called qiyas, this way of thinking. Now, as Imam Shafi'i and other ulama have mentioned, the al-qiyas lil-faqih, the qiyas to a faqih, through to, to a jurist, kalmayit lil mudtar is like dead meat to someone who is needy. So if you have nothing, if you have nothing in the Quran, nothing in the Sunnah, nothing in Ijma, then you resort to qiyas. So Qiyas is not a primary source of knowledge. It is like a last uh, last reference type of thing, okay? So these four places are where we get knowledge for fiqh. Are there any questions so far before we can continue? Because I will erase this to write something else. Just this part here. Very clear so far. I hope everyone is clear as well. And I hope you're copying the notes. Great. So we have explained the first part of the definition, which is the learning. We've explained what learning is, how we should learn, how we should not learn, you know, so we derive our, our information uh, we'll get to ijtihad. We'll, we'll get there. Uh, Islamic rulings which are derived from ijtihad. Okay. Yeah. But basically, ijtihad is something that you 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 make an effort to reach it. Okay. It's a conclusion that is not clear. You need to think a little bit before getting to that conclusion. That's called ijtihad. So, for example, fire burns. That's not ishtihad because it's clear as day. You know, water is wet. It's not ishtihad, it's clear as day. But two plus two equals four. 
that is a little bit of ishtihad, you know, when you come to mathematics, multiplication, division, these things now become ishtihad. Why? Because it requires a brain process. So this is what we call ishtihad. You need to prove, when you need to prove that something is true, that that process of thinking is called ishtihad. But we'll get more on that. So we need to learn about the Islamic rules. We already mentioned where we are supposed to learn. Not the brush, not the pen. So, yes. So now we come to the Islamic rulings. What are the Islamic rulings? The Islamic rulings are five. Five rulings. So, when we study fiqh, when we go to the Quran and Sunnah, we're looking for five things. These are the five things that we want to find out in fiqh. Five. Not more than five, not less than five. So everything that we'll study in fiqh will follow up to one of these five rulings. Okay? So this is what we call al-ahkam al khamsa the five rules. So the first rule that we want to find out, okay, um, is wajib. Wajib. Some people may call it fard. It's fine. It's just a technical uh, dispute. This is something that is obligatory. Obligatory. Okay. So how do we define it? We define it like this. Anything. Anything that is rewarded if you do it or when you do it, either works, and is punishable if you don't. Okay, so watch it. Basically, any action, anything that if you do it, you will get rewarded. There will be a prize. There is a thawab. In Arabic, reward is called thawab. So when you do it, you get a thawab. You get a reward. And when you don't do it, if you don't do it, you get uh, a punishment. Okay, so an example, your five daily prayers. When you pray any of your salah, fajr, you get a reward. But if you don't pray Fajr, then you get a sin. It's punishable. If you pray Dhuhr, you get a reward. But if you don't do it, you get punished. Okay? So this is basically what we call an obligation. It's anything that if you do it, you get a reward. And if you don't do it, then you will get punished. Okay? So second thing that we have is what we call, or we can call, mandu. We could call this mandub. We could call this mustahab. There are many ways people call this. We could call this nafil. Or we can call this sunnah. Okay? So either one of these terms in this situation are synonymous. Okay? When we speak about the five rulings of fiqh, these four terms are synonymous. Mandub, mustahab, nafil, sunnah which basically means recommended. It's recommended. What does that mean? It's not obligatory, but it's good if you do it. So this basically means anything that it is rewarded when you do it. When you do it and is not punishable when you leave it. So if you don't do it, there's no punishment. Why? Because you are recommended. It's something mustahab, it's sunnah. You can do it. But if you don't do it, it's also fine. It's not that bad, okay? Now, an example for this is fasting on Mondays. 
fasting on Wednesdays. If you fast on Mondays, you get rewarded. It's recommended. But if you don't fast on Mondays, then you will not be punished. Sunnah. If you pray two rakah before Salat al-Fajr, you'll be rewarded. But if you don't do it, you will not be punished. So this is what we call mustahab recommended. Anything that has a reward if you do it, but there's no punishment if you leave it. So these are two uh, similar things, obligatory and recommended. Is everything understood here so far so that we can carry on with the next rulings? I don't know if I can go down here. Understood. Okay, now the next one that we will mention is what we call Mubah. Mubah. Mubah literally means permissible. Permissible. What does this mean? Permissible. It means that there is no reward nor punishment. So these are basic, basically things that there's no reward, as we said, or there's no punishment. For example, the style of clothing that you want to wear. Now, we know that men have to cover from their belly buttons, from their navels, all the way to the, to the knees. And women should cover their whole body, uh, except for the face and their hands. Now, what style do you want to wear? So it's, it's okay, you can wear any style. Do you want to wear jeans uh, cloth? Do you want to wear uh, sports clothing? Do you want to wear uh, banana leaves? It's fine, you can wear anything you want, you know, so long as you fulfill uh, the objectives, but the exact color, the style, etc. these are permissible. Mubah, you can wear anything you want, it's okay. Um, eating food, can you eat chicken? Yeah, it's mubah. There's no reward, there's no punishment. So these are basically things that have to do with the dunya, uh, daily daily things, so sleeping, eating, dressing, uh, drinking, going out for a walk, exercising, you know, it's mubah. You can do it. These things have no reward and there's no punishment in it, okay? So we shouldn't take mubah things and believe that there is a punishment or reward in it. Like some people say that, oh, if you dress in a specific way, you will have a reward. Not, not, not really, not really. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ did not go into much details when it comes to dressing. He just said, don't do this, 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 and that, okay? Uh, which are known by everybody. So mubah is permissible, something that there's no reward and there is no punishment. And these things normally don't have to do with direct worship. They don't have to do with acts of worship. Normally they have to do with the worldly matters, okay? As I mentioned. Uh, eating, drinking, dressing, etc. So now we go for uh, Muharram. Okay. Muharram. Uh, some scholars will call it Mahdur. Okay. Some scholars will call it Mahdur, but in the normal language, we call it Haram. Okay. Well, the correct terminology would be Muharram. Okay. People call it Haram, which is basically impermissible. Impermissible, which is basically anything that is rewarded if you don't do it and is punished if you do it. So, this is haram. Haram is when you do something and 
there's a punishment for doing that, like drinking alcohol. But if you avoid drinking alcohol, then you get rewarded because you've left a haram. Okay, so it's basically the opposite of an obligation. Okay, uh, this is pretty clear. So anything that if you do it, there is a punishment. And if you don't do it, there is no punishment. Sorry, if you, if you do it, there's a reward. So if you don't do it, there's a reward. And if you do it, there is a punishment. It's clear what I wrote. Now, the next one will be what we call makruh. Makruh. What does makruh mean? If you actually use this color, it will be better. Makruh. Makruh is basically something that is detested. You really shouldn't do this because it's detested, but it's not haram. It's lesser than haram. So it's basically anything. Anything that is rewarded if you leave it. But is not punished if you do it. So, makru, basically, anything that if you do it, there's no punishment. Sorry, if you, do, yeah, if you do it, there's no punishment. But if you leave it, it's better. Okay, if you leave it, it's better. Such as, uh, let's say, drinking things that might be harmful to your health okay um sugary drinks you know uh oily food etc it's not haram or anything but if you do leave it because you want to preserve your body then you would be rewarded for that because that's a good deed or for example um let's say divorcing your wife is a common example that they give you or divorcing your husband uh, it's not haram for you to do that, but you'd rather not, okay? Uh, if there's no conditions, for, if there are conditions for the marriage to continue, then you'd rather not. Why? Because it's always better to maintain family, okay? So these five rulings, these are what we look when the scholars say that uh, fiqh is to learn about the Islamic rulings. These are the rulings that are mentioned, okay? The five rulings, which is wajib, which is uh, mustahab, mubah, makruh, uh, muharram. Okay, these are the five rules. Any questions so far? Alhamdulillah. Hope everything's being clear. It's very funny when there are no questions because I, I don't know if people are understanding or not, but I'll just have faith, inshallah, that you guys are understanding. Now, next we go to Ijtihad. 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 Ijtihad is the process, okay? The process that the scholars go through to derive specific rulings before specific actions. So, so basically, ishtihad is like the whole process that uh, the scholars of fiqh go through. It's called ishtihad, okay? So the, the, the process, the lawmakers go to comment on the law. Only in this case, um, the scholars are not the lawmakers but they try to understand the law. So what will a mujtahid, mujtahid is the person who does ishtihad. What is he gonna do? He's going to go to the sources, the Quran, the Sunnah, 
the Jama'ah, and he will read all of it. He's going to read the entire Quran. He will read all the Ahadith. And they will organize it in such a way that will make it easy for him to understand what is going on. So we could say that the first thing that uh, a mujtahid will do is one, gather evidence. Right? Gather evidence. Okay, this evidence and evidence is Quran, Sunnah, Ijma. These are the sources of knowledge. Now, after he gathers the evidence, number two, he will understand the evidence. Okay, understand the evidence. And what does it mean by understanding the evidence? So he needs to see if there are any contradictions, apparent contradictions in the text. He needs to see if there is a general text, if there is a specific text. Okay, he needs to see if uh, there is a, one narration is abrogated and the other is a new one. So there's a whole very, very complicated process that the scholars go through to understand the evidence. And you need to understand the evidence in order to know how to use it correctly. And then number three, after he's gathered the evidence, after he has analyzed the evidence, he will now derive at his ruling. He will now derive, sorry, yeah, derive to his rulings, derive to his rulings, at his rulings. I hope that's correct. Derive. I don't think derive is a correct word to be used here. Arrive would be better. He will now arrive at his rulings. So then he will come to his conclusions. He's going to say, this action is wajib. This action is haram. This action is sunnah, etc. after he has analyzed all the evidence. Now, there's one thing that we need to be clear here, that this only works, only works for issues that are not clear in Islam. So you cannot say that, oh, according to my ijtihad, there are five salahs in a day. That's not ijtihad. That's not fiqh. Because it's common sense that you have to pray five daily prayers. It's common sense that you must fast in the month of Ramadan. These are things that th there's no doubt about them. It's completely clear. You don't have to think too much to arrive to this conclusion. Like one plus one equals two. It's it's simple. It's very simple. Now, if you like the, say, if, if, if you teach someone that if you add three angles of a triangle, it goes to 180, then that could be ijtihad, you know? So ijtihad, you, you, uh, it's not something clear. It's something that needs explanation. Now, if it's clear, uh, you, you need to do hajj, then it's not considered fiqh, and uh, we don't really focus on these issues. It's mostly focused on secondary issues. Now, what we normally do in the study of fiqh, okay? What we normally do in the study of fiqh, fiqh could be studied in one of four ways, okay? Actually, it should be studied in all of these four ways, okay? We could say these are the four dimensions of fiqh, okay? So let's just call it 4D fiqh. If you want to be a complete faqih, okay? And uh, I'm still on the path to get there, you know? I hope, inshallah, one day I arrive there. But if you want to be a four-dimensional faqih, which is a, you've mastered everything, you need to learn. Number one, and this is what most people study, but it's only one branch of fiqh, which is furu. It's called furu. What is furu? Furu are the rulings that scholars have ar uh, arrived or derived, okay? So furu, when I study furu, basically what I'm doing, I am studying what theologians from the past, such as Abu Hanifa, such as Malik, what conclusions did they arrive? This is what we study in furu. So in furu, I will study that Abu Hanifa said that this is haram. Uh, Malik said that this is sunnah. Shafi said that, that is wajib. This is called furu. Furu, so basically furu is knowing or understanding the past rulings that the theologians 
derived. For those who are familiar with the, um, let's say, American law, I believe it's something to do with precedence. So you're learning all the precedences that there are. And in Islam, you cannot open a new precedence if there is already an existing one. Okay, there's no need for you to open a new. So this is one version, and this is enough. You know, if you don't want to go too deep in fiqh, studying furu is enough. You know, it's uh, it's good because it's sufficient for you to practice. You're gonna say, look, I don't want to be a scholar. I don't want to be, you know, an imam. So I'll just follow the rulings that a specific scholar followed. And this is called following a madhab. So a madhab are basically a set of rules and rulings that a specific scholar used to derive, to arrive at his rulings, okay? So let me just uh, call here, now a madhab. A madhab, you know, we could say these are rules, okay? Rules and rulings. that a scholar, you know, a recognized scholar, not just any random Joe, that the scholar used, okay, that uh, rules and rulings that a scholar used to arrive to the rules, to arrive to his rules. So when we say a madhab, we're basically studying the teachings of a specific individual. Now, when people don't want to go too deep in Islamic studies, uh, it's good that they only stick with one madhab and they don't start um, studying the conclusions of various individuals. Why? Because if you're not ready, you can get a bit, uh, it can get a bit complicated if you're not ready for it, you know, and if you don't have the time to invest. So if you don't have the time to invest, just rather stick with one madhab. But inshallah, don't worry. That's why I'm here. So furu is one way of learning fiqh, one of the dimensions of fiqh. The second is usul. Usul now are the principles that the individual from the madhab used to derive to his rulings. Now, how did he arrive at these rulings? He used a specific set of rules. And Usul is now studying these specific set of rules and double checking if this individual from the Madhab, like Imam Abu Hanif or Imam Malik, if all of the rulings actually match the principles, which are Usul. And if they don't match, which ones do you choose? This or that, you know, depends. Number three, we have uh, Qawait. Qawait, this is what we call a specific set of rules that apply uh, in any type of situation or most situations when you don't have evidence, when you don't have Quran and Sunnah, there are specific rules that you see that they always come in Islam. For example, uh, we can always tell that Islam tries to make things easy on you. So when things get complicated, when things get hard on you, Islam makes things easy on you. So when you're sick, you don't have to, for example, pray standing up. You can pray sitting down. Why? Because you're unable to stand up. So we can conclude by this that Islam always tries to make it to make things easy on you when things get hard. This is called Qawait. And number four, the last one is Adilla, evidence. You need to know the evidences. Because if you don't know the evidences, then you're not going to really understand how to work in fiqh. Now, this lesson was just basically an introduction to fiqh, and it's not really fiqh itself, because in fiqh, as I mentioned, we focus mostly on furu', especially for be beginner people, which are the rulings that scholars have arrived to, specific scholars, and that's where we will be teaching uh, next week, inshallah. So now I'll be taking uh, your questions, you know, um, for this week. Um, yes, I hope you guys have questions. Did you enjoy the class? Did you learn something new? Can you explain the difference between Qawaid and Usul? Okay. Let me erase this so I can explain the difference between Qawaid and Usul. That is a very common question. So.
which madhab are we learning first? Um, well, I primarily focus on the Shafi'i madhab, but I will present uh, opinions from all four, you know, and if you would like to know specifically about any other madhab, then you can always ask and I will try to get into some detail in it. Uh, I personally study mostly the Shafi'i madhab and the Maliki madhab. These are the two that uh, I like to focus on when I study and when I teach Shafi'i madhab. So we have usul and we have qawaid. Because this is both, this is usul al fiqh and this is qawaid also fiqh. So usul are set of principles. used to interpret texts. For example, for example, let's say that example, okay? A general text is um, sorry, I should actually be in the other way around. So, a specific text takes precedence over a general. Text. Okay, so this is very famous. It's called Am and Am and Khas, general and specific. So, what I'm saying is if we have two narrations and one of them is general and the other is specific, what do I do? I say that the general rule applies unless it's in the specific situation because I believe that a specific text takes precedence over a general text, okay? Um, let me try to think of uh, an example. An example of this would be, you do not pray salah on the five prohibited hours. There are five hours that you cannot pray because the prophet told us, do not pray in these times. So the general rule is that we do not pray in those times unless it is, Based on another narration, in which the Prophet said, if you sleep or if you forget your prayer, then you should pray it as soon as you remind yourself or wake up and you remember that you should pray. So in this situation, we have the general rule, which is don't pray in these times unless you forget your prayer, unless you need to pray, then you pray. So we have a general situation and the specific one takes precedence. Now, this is one way, this is one set of principles. There are many sets of principles, okay? Uh, we'll give you an example in court. So when you're in court, do you take pictures over videos or do you take videos over pictures? In the case that the evidence uh, is a bit contradictory, a picture points that the culprit is one person, but the video points to another person. So if you have your set of rules and you say, look, to me, I always pick videos over uh, for photographs. That's how the legislation works. So this is basically usul, the set of principles and rules that you use them to interpret the Quran and Sunnah. Now, kawa'id, with this, we would translate these as maxims that are used, that are used, okay, in the absence or instead, in the absence, you know, or instead of clear evidence, of clear evidence. So these maxims, they're basically about seven great maxims, okay? And um, we can say that 
anything. Anything. That is harmful. Is haram. So anything that harms your health is haram. This is a maxim. Okay, so if I can prove to you, I've already established that Islam clearly tells that anything that harms your health is haram. So this is a qaida, this is a maxim. So if I can prove to you that something harms your health, it's automatically haram. Like I don't need to bring you an ayah, I don't need to bring you a hadith, okay? Because these maxims, they work in almost every single situation uh, in Islam, okay? Uh, another maxim that we can have, uh, as we have mentioned, would be when things get harder, Islam makes it easier for you. So if you are in a state of hardship, of course, the laws of Islam will be more lenient towards you. Why? Because you're in a state of hardship. But if you're not in a state of hardship, then the laws will remain the same. Okay? So I hope you guys understood the difference between usul al-fiqh and qawa'id fiqhiyya. But it's okay if you did not understand it completely. I mean, it's something that you understand over time. Okay? Are there any more questions? The last I mentioned was adilla, evidence, evidence. Evidence is memorizing the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You need to memorize also what the Sahaba have mentioned about the specific situation, uh, the verses of the Quran. So evidence is basically adilla, is just memorizing the evidences. You need to memorize the, the everything that has to do with evidences. What comes after usul, qawaid. Don't worry, Alina, it's okay. You will learn, you know, as we keep teaching, inshallah ta'ala, you know. Perhaps I went a little bit too deep, you know, maybe. Um, but you, if you just take take the notes and uh, as we go on, you will, you will understand. Today's lesson, I know it's a bit complicated because I'm going to introduction to fiqh and normally it's a bit complicated, you know. Most people study fiqh without even going through all of this. But I just feel that you will have a greater understanding once we do start to explain fiqh. Okay? Now. Any more questions? Well, I guess not. Alhamdulillah. Barakallahu feekum. Thank you guys very much. Sorry for the delay. Next week, inshallah, um, we should be ready by the normal time stipulated. Okay, guys. So, Jazakum la khairan. I ask Allah that he grants us understanding for everything that has been taught here today. I will see you guys next week. Jazakum la khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, what do you mean, Alina? It divides you. I don't know. Um, if you have more questions or if you're not understanding how to refute them, okay. Um, I don't know what you're what you're trying to say, Alina. Are you, are you trying to refute somebody? No, not me. Um, anyways, you can just uh, message me on the Discord server, you know, you, anybody can message me, it's okay, I'm, I'm very open, uh, I might not respond straight away, you know, just, uh, you know, I think the question is how do you respond to the people who belittle the study of fiqh? Um, well, how do we respond to the people who belittle the study of fiqh? Well, maybe it's better if you don't respond to them, because if people belittle the study of fiqh, this shows that they don't understand Islam and they don't want you to understand Islam and they don't want to understand Islam. So maybe it's just better to stay away from these type of people because they're normally a bit toxic. You don't have to respond to them. The Prophet already said, whoever Allah wants good for him, grants him understanding. Yufaqihuhu makes him understand Islam. So that's the study of fiqh, understanding Islam. And if that's not good enough, 
then there's nothing you can say. Okay, so barakallah to you. Zakallah khair. Anything else? Just comments on my uh, Discord channel. Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.